judgment in the matter of ingenious film partners to LLP and others and the Commissioners for Her Majesty's Revenue and Customs. I will ask Lord Justice Nugent to give the first judgment. This is an application under CPR Rule 52.34 for permission to make an application under CPR Rule 52.31 to reopen the refusal of the Commission to appeal. Having heard this morning from Mr Johnson of the Peacock QC, who appeared with Mr Richard Vallett QC and Mr James Rivett QC for the appellant, we announced that we did not need to hear from Mr Johnson Davy QC, who appeared with Mr Michael Jones QC, Mr Sam Chandler and Mr Nick Macklin for the respondent HMRC. That was on the basis that we were satisfied that the Commission should be refused. I now give my reasons for agreeing to that course. This is a further round in the litigation as to the tax treatment of various ingenious entities. The appellants are three LLPs, Ingenious Gains LLP, Inside Track Productions LLP, and Ingenious Film Partners 2 LLP. The latter two of which were involved in the film finance schemes, and the first in a similar scheme involving video games. I will refer to them as the film LLPs and the games LLP respectively, and to the three of them as the LLPs. It is not necessary to give any account of the background. The parties are very familiar with it, and anyone else who is interested can refer to the four decisions which are publicly available, namely two decisions of the First Tier Tribunal, FTT, at 2016 UK FTT 521 TC and 2017 UK FTT 429 TC. That of the Upper Tribunal, UT, at 2019 UK UT 226 TCC, and that of this court at 2021 EWCA Civ 1180. For present purposes, it is sufficient to say that the FTT decided, among other things, that on a true analysis of what the LLPs did, their operations were conducted on the so-called 30-30 basis, not the ingenious basis, and that on that basis the film LLPs, although not the games LLP, were trading with a view to profit. UT agreed with the contractual analysis of the FTT, although their reasoning was not quite the same, but held that none of the LLPs was trading on that basis, nor had a view to profit. The LLPs then applied for permission to appeal to this court. That was a second appeal, to which the appeals from the Upper Tribunal to the Court of Appeal Order, SI 2008-2834, applied. Article 2 of that order reads as follows. Permission to appeal to the Court of Appeal in England and Wales, dot, 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 shall not be granted unless the Upper Tribunal, or where the Upper Tribunal refuses permission, the relevant appellate court considers that, A, the proposed appeal would raise some important point of principle or practice, or B, there is some other compelling reason for the relevant appellate court to hear the appeal. That order was made under Section 13 of the Tribunal Courts and Enforcement Act 2007. The application for permission came before Lord Justice Arnold. Seven grounds of appeal were relied on. By his order, dated 24th of February <coughs> 2020, he granted permission on grounds one, view to profit, and three, trading, on the basis that both had a real prospect of success and raised important points of principle. On the other grounds, that is two and four to seven, he refused permission. I should read the reasons that he gave in his order. Grant 
contractual construction. Although their reasoning was slightly different, both the FTT and the UT came to essentially the same conclusion. Contrary to the appellant's contention, the UT reached its conclusions applying conventional principles of contractual construction, as the UT held and the appellants accept. Ramsey does come in, but at the stage of considering whether the LLPs were trading, I am doubtful whether the appellants have a real prospect of success on the construction issue. But in any event, this ground raises no important issue of principle or practice. Ground four, incurred. This depends on the appellants being correct on ground two. In any event, the FTT and UT reach concurrent conclusions applying what is now a fairly well-established test. This ground has no real prospect of success, and in any event, it raises no important issue of principle or practice. Ground five, wholly or exclusively. Again, this depends on the appellants being correct on ground two. In any event, the FTT and UT reach concurrent conclusions applying a very familiar and well-established test. This ground has no real prospect of success, and in any event, it raises no important issue of principle or practice. Ground six, GMAP. Again, this depends in part on ground two. In any event, this issue was a matter for the FTT's evaluation of the expert evidence, having heard the experts. Moreover, the UT has upheld that evaluation, rightly concluding that the FTT had carefully discharged its task. The appellants challenged those conclusions with no prospect of success. Ground seven, capital income. Again, this depends at least in part on ground two. This ground has no real prospect of success, and in any event, it raises no important issue of principle or practice. The appeal on grounds one and three was then heard over six days by this court. In its judgment handed down on the 4th of August 2021, the court, Lords Justices Henderson and Phillips and Sir David Richards, dismissed the appeal of the Games LLP, but allowed the appeals of the Film LLP on both grounds one and three, holding that they were trading with a view to profit, subject to an outstanding application by the Games LLP for the permission to appeal to the Supreme Court. That is a final determination of all issues. By this application, the LLPs seek to reopen Lord Justice Arnold's dismissal of permission to appeal on grounds two and four, the seventh, under Rule 52.30. It is not necessary for the purposes of this short permission judgment to conduct an exhaustive analysis of the principles applicable to such applications. They have been repeatedly considered and restated by this court in numerous judgments. It is sufficient to make the following points. One, 52.31 itself reads as follows. The Court of Appeal or the High Court will not reopen a final determination of any appeal unless A, it is necessary to do so in order to avoid real injustice, B, the circumstances are exceptional and make it appropriate for reopening the appeal, and C, there is no alternative effective remedy. The same applies to an application to reopen a permission to appeal decision. But that rule is not to be interpreted as conferring a wide-ranging discretion on the court to decide as to whether it's appropriate to reopen an appeal in the light of all the circumstances. The CPR did not expand the court's jurisdiction, but regulated it. That was laid down by this court in Jacqueline Society. Lloyds, 2007 EWCA Civ 586. See the judgment of Lord Justice Buxton at paragraphs 7 to 9, where inter alia he says, the CPR being rules of court cannot extend the jurisdiction of the court from that which the law provides, but can only give directions as to how the existing jurisdiction should be exercised. And dot, 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 and quite apart from that general rule, it is apparent from the wording of CPR Rule 52.17.1, the equivalent of what is now 52.31, which speaks of a jurisdiction not being exercised unless various conditions, including avoidance of real injustice, are fulfilled. But as the helpful commentary in Civil Procedure 2007, Volume 1, paragraph 52.17.1 explains, it is past the limit and not to extend the operation of the supposed jurisdiction under Taylor and Lawrence. In other words, it is not any circumstances which can be characterized as exceptional and make it appropriate for reopening an appeal. 
characterized as exceptional that engage the rule. It is only those circumstances which are exceptional and make it appropriate to reopen the appeal, as exemplified by Taylor and Lawrence in the subsequent cases, that do so. Two, all the cases proceed on the basis that what needs to be shown is something that demonstrates <coughs> that the impugned decision is not a proper judicial decision at all. See, for example, Re Udin, a child, 2005 EWCA Civ 52, at paragraph 18. In the judgment of the court delivered by Dame Elizabeth Butler Sloss, P. Among other things, she says this But the Taylor and Lawrence jurisdiction can, in our judgment, only be properly invoked where it is demonstrated that the integrity of the earlier litigation process, whether at trial or at the first appeal, has been critically undermined. We think this language appropriate because the jurisdiction is by no means solely concerned with the case where the earlier process has or may have produced a wrong result, which must be the whole scope of the fresh evidence but rather, at least primarily, with special circumstances where the process itself has been corrupted. In instances variously discussed in Taylor and Lawrence or in other learning, their sites have been disrupted fraud they relied upon to reopen a concluded appeal rather than found a fresh cause of action. Wood and Garland, Times, 29th of November, 1996. Bias, the eccentric case where the judge had read the wrong papers. The vice in all these cases is not, or not necessarily, that the decision was factually incorrect, but that it was arrived at by a corrupted process. Such instances are so far from the norm that they will inevitably be exceptional. And it is the corruption of justice that, as a matter of policy, is most likely to validate an exceptional recourse and recourse which relegates the high importance of finality in litigation to second play. To that can now be added the recent jurisprudence exemplified by the decision of this court in Municipio de Mariana and others in BHP Group PLC in another 2021 EWCA 1156 C at 63 66 uh, 64 in the judgment of the court delivered by Sir Jeffrey Voss Master of the Royal in which he refers to a failure by the Lord or Lady Justice in question to grapple with the issues raised by the application of the Commission or wholly failing to understand the issues raised. But these are again failures of process. We were not shown any case where a successful application under Rule 6230 had been based on anything other than a failure of process of this type. Three, Mr. Peacock says that something had gone badly wrong with the decision by Lord Justice Armstrong. But it is well established that Rule 5230 does not confer a license on the court to reopen a decision on the grounds merely that the wrong result was reached. There is a very clear illustration of this in Barclays Bank and Guy No. 2, another decision of this court. 2010 EWCA Civ 1396. Third, Lord Justice Lawrence, first on paper, and then again sitting with Lord Justice Carmel in oral hearing, had refused permission to appeal on the ground that the law was clear. On an application to reopen under what was then CPR Rule 5217, the Court of Appeal accepted, as indeed had Respondents' Counsel, that it was possible that the law was not as clear as they had thought. Mr. Guy's case put more strongly on this occasion than it had been before, and on at least one new basis, see paragraph 33. But this was not enough. See paragraph 36, of the judgment of Lord Newburgh of Abbotsford, Master of the Rolls, where he said that neither of the points relied on could be characterised as corrupting the judicial process or even near to doing so. In these circumstances, we asked Mr. Peacock in what respect the process before Lord Justice Arnold could be said to have gone wrong. He said that Lord Justice Arnold had failed to grasp the interrelationship of the various issues. 
but I do not think this is a sustainable criticism. A judge dealing with an application for permission to appear is necessarily bound to grapple with the arguments put before him or her by way of the grounds of appeal and the skeleton arguments. In the present case, the question is the way in which Lord Justice Arnold dealt with ground two. That is because if he was entitled to appeal his permission on ground two, I do not think the decisions on grounds four to seven could be faulted. But they were all presented to him in the skeleton argument before him as dependent, more or less, on the upper tribunal's view on contractual construction, which was the subject of ground two. Thus, in the skeleton argument, it was said as ground four, of ground four, the UT's impermissible approach to the contracts also led the UT to decide that the LLPs had not incurred 100% of the budgeted costs of the film. And on ground five, wholly exclusively, this issue must be considered on the premise that the LLPs incurred 100% of the budgeted costs of the film in the course of the trade to carry on with a view to profit, because this is the only case in which the point is relevant. On ground six, it was said that the UT's rejection of the LLPs accounts and the expert evidence rested on the UT's impermissible approach to the contracts. And on ground seven, it was said that the UT's conclusion that the expenses incurred by the LLPs on making the film weren't capital rests on the UT's <coughs> impermissible approach to the contracts. In those circumstances, the key question is whether anything went wrong with Lord Justice Arnold's treatment of ground two. The very highest that Mr. Peacock put his case on was that the upper tribunal's underlying error on contractual construction was to allow its erroneous perception of the trading with view to profit question to infect its consideration of contractual construction. And so ground two was all bound up with ground one and three. I have very considerable doubts whether this is a sustainable characterization <coughs> of the upper tribunal's decision. The UT first decided the construction question at length and in detail. And as Mr. Peacock eventually accepted in oral argument, this was a decision and not merely over to comment. Their treatment of these issues extends from paragraph 79 to 163 in the main decision, and from paragraphs 564 to 634 in the appendix. It was only once they had dealt with the questions of construction that they went on to consider the questions of trading and view to a profit. That, as I put to Mr. Peacock in argument, seems to me not only what they did, but logically the only way in which they could properly have approached the question. One cannot ask the question whether someone is trading with a view to profit until you know what it is that they are in reality doing. As they themselves said in paragraph 46 of their judgment decision, the OLP's ground one, which was the contractual construction ground, feeds into their arguments on all of the issues. Therefore, after reaching some general conclusions as to the construction of contractual documents, we shall apply our conclusions on the relevant contractual issues that arise when considering each of the issues in turn. But it is not necessary <coughs> to consider that in any great detail. Even putting Mr. Peacock's case at its height, the critical question for present purposes is whether Lord Justice Arnold understood the way in which the case was being put before him. The way in which ground two was characterized in the skeleton argument put before him was, in summary, as follows. UT's conclusions on these contracts were incorrect as a matter of interpretation and in relation to several issues, impermissibly adopted a Ramsey approach to contractual construction in construing the contracts to determine the legal rights of the parties. The UT ignored aspects of the contracts which are viewed as not substantive or lacking commercial reality. It may be open to the court to ignore such matters in deciding whether the transaction answers the statutory description, i.e. on the Ramsey basis properly applied, it is not open to the court to rewrite the contract.
controversial deal between the parties was necessarily the prior stage of establishing what the deal was. And then later, um, if and insofar as the UT decided on the issue of contractual construction against the LLPs on what it considered to be a realistic view of the facts, i.e. the Ramsey approach, the UT committed an error of law. Ramsey is the principle of statutory, not contractual <coughs> interpretation. Nowhere is it said in that skeleton that the decision as to the contractual construction issue, which was the subject of ground two, is infected by the erroneous decisions as to trading and with a view to profit raised by grounds one and three. Nowhere is it said that if permission to appeal were granted on grounds one and three, then it should necessarily be granted on ground two because conclusions on those issues would undermine, favourable conclusions on those issues would undermine the UT's decision on ground two. I therefore reject the submission that there is any material before the court to support the proposition that the process before Lord Justice Arnold was corrupted or came anywhere close to being within the very narrow set of circumstances in which Rule 52.30 was properly invoked. That is sufficient to dispose of the present application of the Commission. I add two further matters. Firstly, one of the points taken by HMRC was that there was an unreasonable delay in its present application of Lord Justice Arnold's decision on permission to appeal was made at the end of February 2020. The appeal was heard over six days in March 2021, and the judgment of the Court of Appeal was handed down on the 4th of August 2021. This application, however, was not brought until the 11th of March 2022, over seven months later. The question is whether that application should have been brought before the substantive appeal was heard, that is, between February 2020 and March 2021. <coughs> Mr. Paycock said no. It was a precondition of a Rule 52.30 application that it could be said to, the decision could be said to cause injustice. And this could not be said until it was known whether the appeal on grounds one and three succeeded or not until that had happened. It could not be said that any injustice had been caused. I unhesitatingly reject that submission. Where permission to appeal has been granted on some grounds, but not others, so that an appeal will take place in any event, an application under 52.30 on the basis that the refusal of permission on the refused ground should be reopened must be brought, in my judgment, as soon as possible. And, assuming, of course, that the relevant facts were then known to the applicant, well before the hearing of the substantive appeal, so that if the 52.30 application succeeds, there can be a single hearing of the appeal rather than two. This is particularly so if, as here, it is suggested that the refused ground should have been permitted precisely because they were all bound up with the grounds on which permission to appeal was granted. Here, the NLP knew the terms of the limited permission granted by Lord Justice Arnold in February 2020 and could, at that stage, have worked out the potential consequences where the appeal on grounds one and three would succeed. It was, in my judgment, wholly wrong to keep Rule 52.30 back until after they saw whether their appeal on grounds one and three would succeed or not. I would have been prepared to refuse this application on that ground alone, and therefore the reason that then did not in fact arise. I add that even if there had been a justification for waiting until the outcome of the appeal was known, it is very difficult to see any justification for delaying from the 4th of August 2021 to the 11th of March 2022 before bringing the application. It is true that Rule 52.30 does not contain any specific time limit. That is understandable, as in some cases it may take a very long time for matters justifying reopening to come to the attention of the applicant. But that does not mean where the applicant does know the grounds on which he wishes to make his application, he can be as leisurely as he likes about it. 
The second point I would like to add is this. Mr. Peacock pointed out that under the terms of Rule 2 of the appeals order, which I read earlier, the question is whether the appeal raises an important point of principle or practice, not whether each ground does. That is true. And the same is true of the second appeals test for appeals from court decisions under CPR 52.7. It was suggested, somewhat faintly, that that meant that Lord Justice Arnold was wrong to consider each of the grounds against this test. I do not accept that. The court has expressed power under 52.6-2A when granting permission, either under this rule, which is the rule for first appeals, or under Rule 52.7, which is the rule for second appeals, to limit the issues to be heard. It is standard practice when considering an application for permission to appeal in a first appeal to consider whether each of the grounds has a real prospect of success, even though under Rule 52.6 the rule is phrased by reference to whether the appeal does. Similarly, it is standard practice when considering <coughs> permission to appeal for second appeal under Rule 52.7 or under Article 2 of the Appeals Order to consider whether the grounds put forward should all be permitted to go forward to a full appeal. I see nothing wrong in the familiar practice of permitting some grounds to go forward on the basis <coughs> they do raise an important point of principle or practice, refusing permission to appeal on other grounds on the basis <coughs> they do not. Of course, if the issues are all truly bound up together, the court may well allow grounds to go forward, even if, had they been viewed in isolation, it were difficult to say that they raised any important point of principle. But it is certainly not in my judgment obliged to permit all arguable grounds to go forward just because one of them, and hence the appeal as a whole, raised some important point of principle or practice. <coughs> Those are the reasons why I agree that permission in this case should be refused. I agree that permission was rightly refused for the reasons given by my lord. I also agree. I'm grateful, my lord. Might I be able to address the court on costs? Yes. Is there much to say? Very little. Um, the application has been brought unsuccessfully, so the client's been put to expense of dealing with it, successfully resisted it. As the court is aware, if an order is to be made, the general rule is that the unsuccessful party pays the successful party's costs. And I say that general rule should apply on this occasion. What are you asking for? That your costs be subject to detail, detailed assessment? You haven't produced a schedule. Correct. The, the order I would seek is that um, the applicants pay the respondents' costs to be assessed if not agreed. I must be right, my lord. Very well. Thank you all. We will therefore um, dismiss the application and uh, make that order as to costs. Uh, thank you to um, all parties for the brisk presentation today. Um, I'm glad everyone has managed to stay cool. <laughs>